go ahead and start this morning. This is the uh, second day of Interconnect 95, and for those of you that were here yesterday, I thought we had just some excellent uh, presenters and some excellent uh, breakout sessions. The comments that I heard from individuals is that I had the opportunity to uh, visit with them just a little bit were very, very positive. And as I look at uh, today's program, I think we will have as equally a good program today uh, as we had uh, yesterday. One of the things that, uh, that I thought I got out of yesterday's session, and I think all of us are coming more and more to realize, that uh, technology is a great tool for us and really gives us an opportunity to do some things differently than we've done before in the teaching learning process. But the technology really is only a tool. And it's those values and, and the way that as human beings we interact with one another and we interact with students that's really the most important thing. And that we can do a lot of those things without technology. And that the, maybe perhaps the glitz that for a long time was associated with technology that as a group of educators and others who grow us past that and really coming to grips with, with true deep-seated values about how people learn and about how to do a better job of, of allowing people to learn. I thought all of the presenters that had the opportunity, particularly our luncheon speaker yesterday, uh, did a good job of addressing that, to, that issue. So this morning, uh, uh, again, welcome all of you to the second day and we're looking forward to an exciting day again today. Introduce our first presenter this morning. I'd like to ask Kent Roberson, the director of the Teaching Learning Center, to uh, come Good morning. About uh, about this time last year, which was about two weeks before our first Interconnect conference, was when I first found out about. Uh, our presenter this morning and uh, one of the many publications that come across my desk uh, the THE journal had an article about Siloam Springs and many of the well basically it was about their partnership with IBM and what they were doing to bring multimedia into their district and it was included their technology plan so uh, this was, as I said, a couple of weeks before our conference. So I thought, well, Siloam Springs, that's not too far away. And the first person I, I got in touch with was Rick Jones, who is, is here today also. He's their technology director. And within a few minutes of talking to him, I kept hearing about Dr. Gunter and how I really needed to talk to her. And so I have been talking with Dr. Gunter off and on now for about a year. And many of the things that they're doing in Siloam Springs are very exciting to us as an institution with what we are doing also. Dr. Gunter is the Assistant Superintendent of, uh, for Instruction and Curriculum and Personnel in Siloam Springs. She's also been very active with the uh, Arkansas Association for Curriculum Development and Supervision. She's the president of that organization. She's been involved with different uh, groups in the state of Arkansas as they look at total quality and how that's brought into the educational arena. She's got a background as a teacher, a principal, a curriculum coordinator, a cooperative director, and now as an assistant superintendent. She's spoken at the national level at many conferences and particularly I understand since they received their IBM grant they have done many presentations in around the country explaining how they're bringing technology into their district in coordination with a plan and with many of the other innovations such as uh, teacher portfolios, authentic assessment for students, mentoring processes, all kinds of exciting trends that are going on in education today. So I'd like to present to you now Dr. Mary Gunter and they're going to talk about Siloam Springs and their technology plan and many of the innovations they're doing. Thank you.
we thank you for inviting us to come. We always like to tell the story about Siloam Springs and hope that we can give folks a vision of what can happen for students in our public schools. With me today is Rick Jones. As Kent had mentioned, she had originally talked to Rick. Rick is what we have in our district as far as making everything work. You can have a lot of great plans, ideas, and visions and wonders, but if somebody doesn't know what button to press, none of your dreams are going to become a reality. So he's been able to take a lot of the dreams I've had, the dreams of our teachers, and really help us understand how they can become reality based on what's available to us today. Rick has been in the classroom. He's been an assistant principal. He once took a course in the early 80s at our junior high that had something to do with technology, and uh, I'm happy to report that Rick is actually self-taught and self-directed in the work that he now does for us. We call him our computer guru. Uh, we keep him too busy. He is going to be sharing this morning. I'm going to let him have a little bit of my time this morning because he has some other obligations back in our district. So I'm, I'm just glad that he's able to at least be here this morning. I have another guest with me, my son Donald. I usually take his picture with me, but we have a wedding in St. Louis. So as I looked at my busy schedule, we decided we could come over here last night we could get up, make this presentation, and hop a flight out of Tulsa to St. Louis. Now, wouldn't you think a fourth grader would be excited about that plan? Do you have a fourth grader? Do you think they'd be excited? Guess what? He wasn't all that excited. Do you want to know why? He's going to miss his perfect attendance award at school this year because he accompanied me on this trip. So for Donald, I have a certificate of achievement. the reason we get excited in Siloam Springs. We have a lot of Donalds and they're all ages. And I think that's what's important for us to remember that the main focus of our decision must be for our youngsters, whether they're in kindergarten or whether they're graduating from our schools. Let me tell you a little bit about Siloam Springs. We use this first slide in our folder because we have many visitors that come to Siloam Springs. Our population is 8,151. Now that may not sound very big, and it can be misleading, but what you have to understand, we are about six miles from the Oklahoma border, so we have a retail population of about 75,000. We bring in folks to Siloam Springs from small Arkansas communities and Oklahoma communities. We have not only a Walmart, we have a couple of grocery stores, we have everything you'd ever want on Junk Food Alley in Siloam Springs. Now that's not necessarily true of a community that only has 8,000 people in their city proper. So we always say it's misleading, but what we're beginning to feel is that perhaps our traffic may become congested before too long. So what we do is use this slide to demonstrate that we are trying to prepare for the future and what we've done to personalize this to you is put the little OSU sign up there, feeling that we were probably coming to a metropolitan area that would be much bigger than Siloam Springs, America. What I found was last night at 5.30 when I figured I'd be bumper to bumper in Tulsa traffic was I breezed through Tulsa until I got to 75 out here out of Tulsa and all of the brake lights started hitting about 6.45. So I knew that this slide was appropriate. I was going to hit a major traffic jam coming into the moment. <clears throat> Our community also has a lot of homegrown business that provides some of the uniqueness we feel that has allowed us to make some innovations and changes. Simmons Industry is one of the poultry leaders. We have Allen's Cannon Co Company. We have Gates Rubber. We have Franklin Electric. And most important to our school network is John Brown University. John Brown is a small private college, has about 1,200 students right now, and is a partner with Siloam Springs in many educational initiatives. So as I understand, we have some folks from higher ed, higher ed that are here today, as well as our K through 12 folks, and I'm going to try and tailor some of my remarks to address those audiences. It's going to take both public schools and university programs working together to make the significant difference that we've got to make for programming and the training of our students. 
We have to look at how our schools are operating. We have to look at our college and university programs and how they operate. And somehow they both need to be on the table as we ask questions. What should we be teaching? How should we be teaching? And what is it our students need to be successful? And that's what we've been embarking upon with our folks at uh, John Brown University. I want to talk to you about the population of our school system. We have approximately 2,643 students in Silent Springs, and you can see the demographics here, that we have a true primary building. In this primary building, we're looking at continuous progress. We're looking at non-graded primary. We're looking at ways that we can loop with our students so that we can provide them the most appropriate education. We only hire those teachers that are uh, early childhood certified so they can stay with their students when they enter a kindergarten and they leave after first grade so that we have that continuous progress concept. Southside is our true intermediate school, grades two through five. We opened a brand new middle school this year that is a true middle school, grades six, seven, and eight. The building was designed specifically for middle school programs. We have every wire you would ever want in a building to make this school a high-tech school. Now, if you are a benefactor in the audience and would like to write us a check for the equipment to plug into the wires, we are here to take that donation. There will be an offering at the end of this service. Uh, we had enough foresight after going into Northside and Southside, two of our older buildings, to understand technology does take money. It, take money, it takes money to bring power in, to, re to rewire, to network. So we're ready for the middle school. We're just waiting for those folks that are ready to help us out. Our high school is now a 9-12 high school, and for the first year, we have gone to a block schedule. The thing that's important about Salem Springs, and I've had the opportunity to work as a consultant with districts of all sizes, from as small as Olark with about 200 students, K-12, through to as large as Little Rock Public Schools, is we're an ideal size for looking at dreams and innovations and change. And we can do those kinds of things much more quickly and more rapidly than a lot of systems that are tied up with a lot of bureaucratic structures. So we are seen as a prototype by many folks around the country and also in our state, simply because we have the structure and the mechanism by which we can do that. Now, in our file, we always try to, again, point out the fact that we are trying to look at where the future is, and that's the title of this presentation. And I'm not always lucky enough to have Donald with me, so I always have to take his slide or his picture wherever I'm going to remind us that we must be focused on the students. Now, what, what do you see that looks different about Donald? Do you see anything different about this child as you look at this screen? Looks like a fairly happy kid. Looks like he might need some orthodontic work down the road. Uh, but this is a child who will never know a classroom without technology. And as we move through this presentation, you'll have a better understanding of this. When Donald started in first grade, our technology plan started. Now, some people thought that was pretty interesting, considering the assistant superintendent had a child in the first class that started with technology. And I just said we were willing to let Donald and his class be the guinea pigs for that first year, because I can assure you everything goes wrong the first year. <clears throat> what we're trying to do is impact education for our students. And we're trying to do that by connecting to teaching and learning. I appreciate your opening comments, your reflection on what took place yesterday, because that's what our basic philosophy is, is we're not interested in equipment and we're not interested in technology. We're interested in how we can best impact education and impact our students and impact what teaching and learning is all about in order to prepare them for a world that awaits them. So you have one question you have to ask yourself as you make changes and you look at the future, and that is how can technology assist us in reaching these goals? What I want to cover today or this morning, and, and that is the good news. I like what I do. Can you tell that? The bad news is I could be here till 5 o'clock talking about this. <laughs> The uh, good news is Rick has me in Silent Springs at 12 and I have to catch a plane at 1, so we'll try and be finished by about 10 to 10. What we want to cover are three basic topics. We want to talk to you about a process. We want to talk to you about our philosophy, and we want to talk to you about some product and programming that are a result of our process and our philosophy. We say there must be a, a, a process for true educational change to take place. We call this renewal. 
It's something that we have been looking at and working on for years in education. It's simply school improvement. How do we continue to improve our school? Our basic philosophy, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, is bringing technology to where teaching takes place. We're not interested in technology for remediation. We want to first start with where learning takes place. And then we want to look at products and programs. Until you really make concerted efforts to restructure what you're teaching and how you're teaching, you're only making, circle, only making superficial changes. And what we've got to do is really answer the hard question with the R word. Now, I don't know in Oklahoma that the R word is very popular. Sometimes it's not too popular in Arkansas. They don't want to hear you talk about restructuring anything. But when you get right down to what has to take place, it is the process of restructuring of the classroom. The renewal process that we talk about is one that is systemic in movement. It's one that's built upon concepts, and they're very important concepts. Shared decision making. Superintendent Dr. Spear, who you'll meet later on in this presentation, has long been a proponent of shared decision making, not top down decision making. What we find is that if we spend enough time on the front end making decisions, we're going to find we spend less time defending decisions that are made just by the administration. So that the success of what we're doing in Simon Springs, we attribute to the fact that we have all the players at the table when the decision is being made, and we've spent a lot of time developing our philosophy in order to have the buy-in that is necessary for true implementation. It's one thing to say we need to change teaching and learning, and your classroom teacher are your new computers. But it's another thing when you have the classroom teachers involved with you making that decision, because the difference will be in the use of the equipment. You'll find that the teachers who have been part of that decision are utilizing the equipment. The teachers who were given as a present the equipment will have that equipment still in the box or sitting on the table not being utilized two years later. I spend more work in districts consulting to help them understand that they've got to go back and reinstitute a process, get buy-in in order for this to take place. We call it renewal in Silent Springs. We have broad-based involvement. The visionary leadership is certainly not myself, it's certainly not the superintendent. We depend on it to be the community and to be our teaching staff to provide us the vision of what can take place with teaching and learning in the classroom. There has to be open communication, some kind of structure, and a productive climate. We're trying to look at productivity through people. In business and industry, they have some work out. It's called the Reengineering Revolution. There's a companion book to this, the Reengineering Handbook, and this is written by Michael Hammer. Is anybody familiar with this? I would suggest if you want to take a look at something that pretty much resembles what we're doing in Silent Springs, I'm glad these gentlemen wrote the book because they document pretty much what we do in Silent Springs with a systemic process for planning in place that makes sense and works for the long run. So we say that first there must be a process and there must be a structure for that process to take place. And just quickly, we have what we call a district-wide renewal council that has all of the players on board when we make decisions. We recognize the fact that there is a board of education and, then, and there is an administrative arm, but most of the decisions in Silent Springs are recommended from this district council after much time has gone into the planning and the research. We're proud to say in Silent Springs that we have 38 minute board meetings instead of three hours and 80 minutes or whatever happens in so many communities around our country because we do the work before we ever get to a board meeting. Board members are already well informed. They know it's been well thought out and well planned and we do what you ought to do at board meetings, transact business and then we go to the house. So I think it's very important to understand that there must be a process for decision making and that people must be represented in that process in order to have the smooth transition you need in order to make the changes that are, are necessary. This is just a quick look at the involvement of our people. The teachers represent the teachers in the building. They also have councils at the building level. We have each building, and the next slide will show an example of how an individual elementary school also has their connection with district renewal, with the central office, with the students, parents, and their faculty and staff in the decision-making process. It took us a while to get our technology plan in place, but that's because we took the time to properly plan, and we feel that's why we have been successful in its implementation.
look at this line. This is what makes the difference. We're committed to bringing technology where teaching takes place. Technology must be implemented at the point of instruction, and I would add to that, not at the point of remediation. <clears throat> now, that does not necessarily say we do not believe in labs in Silent Springs, but the first place we feel students should have contact with technology in the teaching and learning process is in the classroom. Now, as I travel around to various schools, sometimes that's not always that popular. We have a lot of folks that feel that technology is very important, but it's much better if we have it in the lab and somebody comes and takes our students down there and does to them whatever needs to be done to put their hands on the keyboard or utilize that piece of technology. What we have committed to is the fact that that is not part of what we believe in inclusion. I don't know how popular that is in the state of Oklahoma, but we're very committed to inclusion and not taking students out of the classroom. So to take students out consistently, particularly at the elementary level, to go to the various labs is not where our philosophy is. We have labs at some of our other schools, and Mr. Jones will talk to you about that. But what we're trying to do is help our teachers understand that technology is just there to support them in a daily basis. Now that doesn't mean we don't have teachers that still are at the stage, we don't know if we want those coming into our classroom. Have you ever heard that? You, you have any of that in Oklahoma? I don't know. We do in Arkansas. I just worked in Fort Smith School not too long ago, and uh, they're really frightened about the fact that maybe they might come into the classroom, meaning, meaning the technology. But we will share with you our experience and assure you that as our plan has been developed over time, you would not get the teachers who have the technology in the classroom to give the technology back to you. As a matter of fact, they tell us that we have shortchanged them and they need more technology, not less. So I think that uh, that has been exciting for us over the years to see that indeed our philosophy has proved to be true in the classroom. Now we have district goals that support this. The first goal, the competency and challenging matters. Do you recognize that from the uh, Goals 2000? We have adopted that in our district. Capable of national and international competition in science and math. And then we have our own district goal that is developing a functional understanding of technology and preparing them to meet the uh, needs of the world of work so that we have district goals that tie directly to national goals that then are independent with some of our own goals ourselves. Now look at a curriculum support plan. What do you notice difference, different about this title? It's not a technology plan. It's a curriculum support plan. We have very definite means by which we use technology to support our curriculum, and they appear in our curriculum support plan. We look at grades K-8. We look at starting in 1992 with our plan, and we say that we are going to network all classrooms with technology and allow our students to begin utilizing technology as we restructure our reading and language arts curriculum. That was the first commitment that we made in this plan. What we wanted to see was that carried out through the eighth grade with the uh, necessary supporting software for our reading and our language arts program. Mr. Jones and I spent some time with IBM at one of their headquarters looking at this plan and how it might affect our district. And then we sat down one night in a nice large room with a lot of whiteboards around and we started to put the cost of that plan up. After we costed out that plan for network computers and technology in Silent Springs through the eighth grade, neither one of us wanted to get on the plane to go home and share that with our superintendent. It had a pretty hefty price tag. So what we thought was if we could convince him to take one year at a time, and start with the first grade students that were already implementing technology, specifically the writing to read curriculum that IBM offered. We had support of parents, we had support of grandparents, we had support of the community, and we just took our time following that first grade group of students through the system till they hit the eighth grade, possibly we could afford it. We had a millage increase that provided us some money to begin this plan, and that was the commitment the board was able to make. Naturally, we'd like to do everything at once, 
but it would not work that way financially. Uh, sometimes we think we probably have overextended ourselves just by following one grade level at a time when we run into various problems with wiring, et cetera, and personnel and staff development and training, but yet it has become a manageable plan and one that has the buy-in and support of the community as these youngsters move from one grade to the next grade with this uh, capacity and capability. Now, what did that mean at the secondary level? We have a lot of exciting things. Mr. Jones is going to talk to you about some of those programs at the secondary level, but that was done on a basis of curriculum changes. We would ask the teachers, what is it you think that you would do different with teaching and learning in the classroom? And if that's what you would do, next, ask yourself, how could technology assist us in doing that? So what we did was receive from secondary teachers their curriculum plans. And if we saw that they had a curriculum plan that would really address the restructuring issues and then move forward with the technology, we would begin to fund those plans one at a time. We had a year where we had plans that we received in from some of the teachers, but then we had requests for equipment from some teachers. So in our district, with our philosophy, we funded those with well thought out curriculum plans and we returned the equipment request. And it didn't take but one turnaround period with not funding equipment that most teachers realized there would be no equipment in their room without some kind of a plan that would address the curriculum and instruction issues for our students for the next century. So what we look at is what we teach and how we teach. We're very committed in Siloam Springs. I hate to use the restructuring word, but that's basically what we're doing. We're trying to look at the ways we can better establish our curriculum and instructional program to make our curriculum more relevant to the students by weeding out obsolete knowledge and obsolete information. And it's there. If you will look at your curriculums, look at them very carefully, you'll find out that we're te teaching a lot of out-of-date material and a lot of obsolete information that is not necessary, and we don't have time to do that today, folks. We've got to move forward with what kids need to function in society, and that's very hard, and that's why I say without a process, you'll never make it. You have to have that commitment, and you have to have that vision to be able to say, it doesn't matter that I've taught that concept for 15 years. I don't need to teach it. That's a concept that no longer do I have to spend six weeks on when I need that valuable time to move forward with where we're going with teaching and learning and what's necessary for these kids to be uh, functional and productive in our society. That's not an easy task. And we have some teachers who have not stayed with us because they realized that they were not ready to make that kind of change. And we do have other school districts in Arkansas besides Silent Springs that we can help them find employment in. But I think what you have to look at is the fact that technology itself makes so much obsolete in our curriculum that we have to address that issue. Now, how we teach, how well, I just want to draw, I guess, right? How we teach is something else that we have to look at. We have to look at the impact that technology can have on just the basic delivery of instruction to our students. And you see so many things that have happened for us in education that have helped us in the retraining scenario. Somebody says, what makes this work in your district? And I said, there's three things. Training, training, and training. Without it, it's not going to work. You have to provide the staff development opportunities. You have to plug into the training in order to equip your teachers to better deliver the curriculum to the students. We look a lot at cooperative teaching, cooperative learning, in order to really provide that sense of teaming among our students, which business and industry tells us is what's going to happen when they get into the real world. We spend a lot of time with hands-on activities. We look very closely at interdisciplinary curriculum. We are integrating our curriculum to connect knowledge so that our students can then take that knowledge and move forward in ways that will best meet their needs and the application. No longer can we just teach skills with no relevancy and no application. The teaming becomes very important. We feel our kids need to work together to solve real life problems and they need to learn from each other and we find that this has become very crucial as we've looked at what we've done to make learning more relevant to the students in Silent Springs.
What should we be doing for students with teaching and learning? Don't let technology make you change. You need to understand that technology itself is there as a support and an application to help you make the changes that are needed. And again, I will go back to our focus on curriculum that we must take a look at the changes that are necessary in teaching and learning and learn how we can best utilize technology to make that happen. There's something else that we're becoming very much aware of that helps us as we deal with our public and our constituents as far as the actual use of technology. We've got a lot of new brain research that is becoming available. I'll share with you one source of information. It's called A Celebration of Neurons. This is an educator's guide to the human brain. Has anybody been read this book? It was off the press in June publication of ASCD. This is published by Robert Sylvester, who is at the University of Oregon. And what he does is explain to us that what we are now learning about the brain is something that good teachers, how many good teachers do I have? That? All right. You guys already know. You already knew this. You've said it. How many times have good teachers told us, why do we worksheet kids today? You ever said that? You know, the days of the dental queen or king are over. But now it's no longer just the assistant superintendent who says this is not good for kids. We've got the brain research that says our youngsters are really not capable of doing isolated, sustained activities like worksheets. The MRI is going to revolutionize, I think, what we do with teaching and learning in the classroom. And it's going to be very hard for a lot of people to understand and take some of this research and make the kinds of changes that are necessary. I don't know if any of you, how many secondary teachers do I have out here? How many of you are in business? I don't know how much blood I lost when I first went to Siloam Springs and even entertained the idea that we ought to put computers in the elementary schools as early as kindergarten and put the hands of those kids on the keyboard. And I had teachers telling me, you can't do that. You're going to ruin the kids. They're going to get bad habits. Well, we said, we don't think so. They're coming to us having had their hands on those keyboards at home anyway. Something's telling us that they can take these video games and their dexterity is there. We don't believe that. And we're going to pilot that. Well, guess what? How many years later, if I only would have had this book, did they tell us that the brain research indicates that indeed, we ought to have youngsters on a keyboard as early as possible. They talk about cursive writing. How many of you just love cursive writing? It's something you wish you could teach from 9 o'clock to 5 o'clock. Uh, cursive writing historically was invented for one reason, to allow people to get more words per minute on a manuscript page. How lucky we are that we now have technology to accomplish that goal. Now, don't throw eggs at me. I'm not saying we don't need to teach penmanship. Yes, you must write so I can read it. But what I'm saying to you is that we need to allow the students to be able to utilize what they have and their capacity to be able to write, to be able to think, to creatively design. Our kids are writing stories. They're editing those in first grade. Multimedia presentations, we believe, are going to be the new way of what our youngsters will be able to do with technology. So what does that do to the middle school curriculum? We shouldn't have to teach keyboarding. We're going to be teaching application and exploratory courses when Donald's class gets to the middle school. Now that doesn't mean you won't see keyboarding in our curriculum, it'll be there because we'll have students transfer in and we'll have students that need to further address. But the kids that are proficient by the time they get to our middle school need to continue their work processing, their application skills, the spreadsheets, the graphing. So what does that mean to the high school? My high school teachers, I better be able to deliver the student I've been promising them for the past four years. They're going to get to the real meat and potatoes of what needs to happen in the high school curriculum. Right now, we're still teaching some of these technology skills, but our whole high school curriculum is going to change. 
and we changed to a block schedule this year because we cannot measure seat time. We have to have larger blocks of learning time for our students. So we're preparing our schedule in order to meet Donald's class when it gets there. So we're really excited about what technology can do and how technology is only there to help you make some changes that need to be made in what teaching and learning is all about. So I'm going to now let Rick spend a little bit of time talking about that third component, which is the programming, and I'll be back to say some more to you about the assessment issue. Thank you, Mary. She can talk fast, can't she? Sure, but she still can't cram four hours into 30 minutes. Mary and I kept saying as we were looking at this stuff that she'd look at me and say, you know, I, I think we have too much. <laughs> and I think actually we've run enough stuff here for about four days. But uh, we'll try to give you a, an overview. And uh, if you see something that interests you, give us a call. There will be a screen at the end that tells you how to contact us. And uh, we would be happy to talk with you further. I told Mary on many occasions that uh, as we went to different conferences and conventions and things, and, and a lot of them, uh, some high dollar technology conferences, all these big leagues would stand up here and, and tell you how great technology was, but uh, they, didn't, they didn't use it to talk to you. About the fanciest they ever got was an overhead projector. And you know, that, that never did make sense to me. If technology is so great, why don't they use it when they, when they talk to you? So that's what we try to do. And one of the reasons is not just because we think technology is so great, but we ask our kids to do that. Uh, most of our courses, all of our courses at the high school, the interdisciplinary courses, require some type of final demonstration of mastery with a multimedia project. So we expect our kids to do the same thing that Dr. Gunner and I are doing this morning. So one of our ulterior motives is to take this equipment on the road and see if it actually works, and see what we we need to do to make it better. Now, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking to you today because we have a lot of uh, good video that uh, will probably show you and tell you more uh, about what's going on in Solomon Springs than I could uh, in the next hour or so. This first clip that I want to show you on tape is from a group called uh, Southwest Educational Development Laboratories. I don't know if you're familiar with them or not, but they came a couple of years ago and spent, uh, uh, we told them they could come visit and spend time in our school and do some filming if they would go to uh, every school district and go all the way through our system because we had had people come and film before. It takes a lot of class time, it takes a lot of organization, and it takes a lot of time away from your, your teachers. So, you know, we, we told them if we could get something from it, we would be glad to have them come. This is a federally funded group that uh, is in the business of disseminating information about education. They came and spent two days with us and did an excellent job. Uh, we were very glad that we uh, accepted their offer. They left us with uh, hours and hours and hours of videotape, which our kids are using to put together presentations of their own with some new video editing equipment that we have. Uh, this, this little clip that I'm going to show you is just about five minutes long. It's narrated by Dr. Gunner, and it takes you all through our system, so you get kind of an overview of not only our philosophy, but some of the things that are going on uh, actually in the classroom, because that's where we believe technology uh, has to be implemented. So if I can get all, and that's why Mary brought me along to operate all the buttons. If I can get all these to work right, um, <coughs> So what we find is technology is a support to that. We ask teachers to look at how they might restructure teaching and learning in the classroom and how in turn technology might help them accomplish that goal. We try to involve teachers in all the decision making processes as far as curriculum is concerned. And uh, when we started listening to teachers, they're the ones that develop most of these programs that change the way we do teaching. And uh, by allowing them to take risks without fear of failure, I think probably is 
one of the best things we've done. Our students were lacking some of the skills that they needed whenever they graduated. We weren't challenging them to use enough creative skills, enough higher level thinking skills. One of our first experiences was a willingness on the part of our business teacher and our art teacher to take a look at their curriculums and how they might connect together and how we might offer an integrated approach to graphic designs that would be facilitated by a technology base. When we started this course, there was no other course that we could find that integrated these two disciplines. Um, and it seems such a natural because we have the technology. The primary concern we have with our students is to help them connect knowledge that too often our systems have been fragmented in offering knowledge but never connecting that knowledge together. We also integrated not just uh, desktop publishing technical skills, but we integrated marketing skills as well. The students will interview the client, produce the work, and then present it to the client. It was scary at first because we would tell these people, you're going to get quality work. It may be from different people in the class, but out of 20, there would be five or six that I felt for any given client uh, were really strong looked good. Creative publications, it's taking your your computer skills that you're learning for your future and it's combining with art to show you who you are. It also helped me realize that there is a side of art that I can't do because I couldn't paint, I couldn't draw free hand or anything, but the computer really helped me realize that I could do art. One of the reasons that we feel technology is so important in the schools is that it has such great capabilities for energizing the teachers and the students. There's great possibilities for modernizing the curriculum. This has helped me a lot in college. And there's still a lot of things that I don't know about computers. But I have found that those students that have a tremendous knowledge about computers are just ahead of the other students in college and in the real world. We look at a lot of activity with an essential question where many of our students at the high school are examining in, in a course called Paradigm the look at change in Northwest Arkansas. Basically what we did was we tried to divide each of the groups up with representatives for each of the four classes who, with their expertise within that class, were able to put together a project about a certain topic. The information that I gained is information that nobody else has, and it's hands-on information. The water quality people did some surveys around town about the water quality in Salem Springs, which had been a concern in the town. They looked into the different ways that the community was looking into different water sources. And were able to give a final solution, which was accepted by the city. The thing I learned probably most was responsibility. Just a an incredible amount of responsibility. You're working with a group, but it's, it's your own thing. You have to learn to think for yourself. One of the key features is that we are all networked, that we can't communicate from one classroom to another. I don't know how we could have done it without being networked. You do learn a lot, and it gives you some insight to look at things in the future and not just think of today. And it gives you uh, the feeling that, you know, these are things that you're going to be handling. Another piece that we see with the technology is the fact that students can put together full-blown multimedia presentations to demonstrate exactly what they have been able to learn through the connection of knowledge and the solving of real-life problems. People from the community, our parents, um, people that we had talked with, the teachers, faculty, other students came in, you know, just came in to watch us. And that was so nice to be able to get up present what you had learned. They will integrate many of the disciplines and try to solve a problem in a manner in which they can present a solution to the public, for the public to look at, be critical friends of, and ask these students questions. We're kind of sheltered here, and I'm realizing that as I go off to college, you know, but these classes, as strange as it may seem, have opened me up to a world that I could never have imagined without there and has prepared me better for going off to a, a college where I have to stand up for my own and I have to know why I believe what I believe and know that those beliefs are mine. Definitely here to stay 
and all the businesses have been using them for uh, 10 or 20 years. Uh, it's something that a little bit new to schools, but it's certainly the direction that we need to go. You heard our last teacher, Connie Matchell, say she just didn't know how she could do it if the, all of the kids were not networked together. Uh, and that's the way we've tried to do it at the high school. As teachers came on board that had an integrated uh, project or an inter integrated course and received the necessary training, those are the classrooms that we started with in adding to the network. And we try to add a few uh, classrooms every year. We are currently networked not all through our district, but we're working on that. And uh, you probably read about the state of Arkansas and an organization called LabScan. Uh, they started off with an initial amount of $20 million. They are helping school districts run fiber optics and to get all of their buildings networked together and to get them on the internet. A tremendous help to us. We currently have a K-1 building. We have five computers in every one of our first grade classrooms, all running uh, writing to read, stories and more, measurement time and money, and lots of other things. I have an individual screen on each of these, but I'm going to skip those uh, because we're running a little behind time. We also have a two through five elementary building. Uh, currently, all of the second grade classrooms have five network computers. The third grade all has five network computers. In October, we're hoping that all of the fourth grade classrooms will have five network computers. And next year, uh, in keeping with our technology plan, all of the fifth grade classrooms. So that entire uh, complex will have five computers in each classroom. The fifth grade now has access to a lab. So each one of the grades in that building uh, does have access to network computers. In our new middle school in six through eight, we have spread throughout that building. We have a fiber optic loop that runs throughout the building and we have some 270 uh, ethernet connections spread all through the building. Uh, as Mary said, we're looking for funding. We'd like to have 270 computers to plug in to all of those outlets. We don't have that done yet, but uh, we, we certainly have the wiring uh, that will provide us that capability. Then at 9 through 12, we have three labs. We've got an older uh, 386 based lab, a little bit newer 486, and this year we just put in 21, a 21 station uh, Pentium 75 megahertz lab uh, where we do our desktop publishing and the, the higher end coursework. Now, what I want to do before Mary talks to you in a little more detail about uh, product and programming is to show you just a couple of quick examples of network computers in our school. The first is in an elementary setting, and I want you to watch the, uh, the interest, the enthusiasm, and the intent on those kids' faces as they are working on the computer. The second is a secondary example and has uh, maybe not quite so much to do with computers as a, a different kind of technology which involve calculators. But you know, there's a lot of technology out there. Sometimes we forget this. There's a lot of technology that doesn't have a whole lot to do with computers, so that doesn't mean it's not good. It is. And I think you'll be fascinated, as I was, I stayed through the whole class period when we were filming this section in the math class because I was so fascinated with the way the teacher was integrating these handheld calculators uh, with her math lesson, which really enabled her to deal with the meaning of mathematics. You know, back in the old days when I used to be a math teacher, I spent a lot of time at the blackboard uh, drawing stuff out or, or drawing my graphs. You don't have to do that anymore. A teacher can put an equation up on the screen, either with a computer or with these handheld calculators, and then they can talk to the kids about what the equation means, not about how to draw it on the blackboard. So uh, watch for that. At the end of this, this so go ahead, put your headphones on. Listen to what it's asking you to do. I'm going to make sure the printer is hooked up. But we're on. There's a lot we can say about how to integrate computers in the classroom. A lot of teachers are scared to death. It's going to completely okay. destroy their classroom. It doesn't have to be the case at all. The planner, I'll try. Very good. Hear what he said? Okay. Put those in, please. Uh, Let's see, we have a 4x quantity squared. 
that's a projection from her. I think that's a TIE two. We can't see it very well. Okay, there's history. the parent one. See it real well in the there's the one that got real skinny and I guess you could say that one got real fat there. It didn't really do that. What it really do? What it really do? It stretched it horizontally. And move that. Very careful. This was a lady who had no previous experience with computers. And then I had to see it all that puts in her classroom. Doesn't bother at all now. Now we can do the same thing with this if we were using it. Okay. Go to the uh, back of your sheet. The back side. Put my parent function back in. So there's my parent function. And the other one is negative 1.4x squared. What's the relationship? What's negative going to do to it? So now, what else did it do to it? What it's else did it do? It compressed it. It compressed it horizontally. <laughs> it did what? Compressed it horizontally. Good evening, I'm Rob Walton. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to let Mary tell you a little bit more about the specific products that we've So we had a lot of bundle technology that we're trying to mm. Uh, I walked into a first grade class and uh, the speakers on the side of the computer, the headphone on the child, and apparently the child was being told to put a period at the end of the sentence, which is part of what we think is so important in our curriculum to give immediate reinforcement to the students for the learning. And the little girls bending down to the speaker saying, Lady, I'm trying, I'm trying, lady. You know, and we just go, you know, we just had more fun as we changed teaching and learning. We had the third grade classroom teacher that you saw on that short little clip. Uh, she was already that first day that she was going to put the students in their various work settings and get them on the computers. And one little boy threw his hands up and said, Teacher, teacher, this is not going to work. You know, he had two years experience. She hadn't had any. And uh, you know what? That teacher had enough sense to say, well, what do you suggest? And that young man organized that classroom, and we probably had the greatest degree of implementation in that classroom. So there's just a lot of different things that we have to be willing to do, be flexible, and be ready to go, because the students can help us get where we need to go. Now, what I want to say very quickly about product and programming is that we have a real commitment that our curriculum must change and we must emphasize with our students at all ages, research skills, team building skills, critical thinking skills, and communication skills, and these skills learn to learn a, help us look at how we're going to have to assess students in a completely different manner. Bubbling in on a test is not what is going to tell Mr. Simmons or Mr. Allens or Mr. Franklin whether or not that student is going to be able to really perform on the job, or actually, if you get serious about it, whether or not they're going to be successful in college. And I think you heard that from the students on that previous clip that talked about how after being in college, they felt they had such an advantage over other students because they did have research skills. They did know how to work in teams, and their communication skills were important. What we look at in authentic assessment is that we do want students to demonstrate. We're moving in our high school to a requirement where there will be a final demonstration of mastery for diploma. That will be a local requirement, not a state requirement. We'll have a state requirement for an exit exam in 97, but we're looking at a performance demonstration requirement in our own school district. We have just not put the date on that. Many of these classes that Rick will share with you in a few minutes requires the students to be able to orally communicate the research that they have done, the findings that they have found, try to solve solutions with our community issues or national or state issues and make some kind of an oral presentation and respond to questions and answers. Now we have been very successful with this as you also saw on that clip where we tackled the city water issue. Now where does technology come into this? It's necessary to integrate the curriculum. 
so that the students can work together as teams so they can access the information. That tells you our teachers are assuming different teaching roles. Teachers don't have all the answers and teachers don't have all the knowledge. Neither do I or neither do you. But what we can do is provide them with the skills that are necessary to access that information so that we're really changing how teachers teach and how students learn in our system with this type of approach. Now, after being very successful and coming to a commitment with our high school program in these areas, we have said to ourselves, how far down can we push this and expect it of students? We continually get research. We had research out this summer from the Bureau of Labor Statistics that still says it does not matter. Supposedly, business and industry says it does not matter what's on a transcript from our uh, high school or from your university. What matters is can they communicate and work on the job? Can they communicate written, through written correspondence, through written work, and can they communicate orally in order to be able to be successful? So we look at that and we say, we really believe communications is important. So when do we start that? All curriculums have requirements for communication, for oral communications. But when does it really need to start? We piloted last year with second grade the same kinds of things we're expecting out of our secondary students. We ask them to do research. We ask them to work as teams. We ask them to really think. And then we said, you're going to communicate this to the public. What we did was ask them to research something about animals. We asked them to use a visual to explain to us about their animal and be ready to answer questions. So the big day came that these second graders were going to be all cleaned up and ready to go and mom and daddy were going to be up there. And I had my invitation to come over and we sat down and the first little girl put their armadillo up on the board and began to add their little quote card behind them and kept trying to make this one. They had to make at least, uh, have at least two minutes of information. Most speeches lasted about one minute with these kids. Pretty soon you'd see those cards come out in front and they begin to get a little bit more comfortable and tell you about their animal. And then it came time for what I call the uh, real critical thinking aspect of this demonstration. And that was to open it up to questions. And all of a sudden I thought, oh, I'm not prepared. I'm always prepared for those high school students to ask the questions. Oh, I've got to hurry up and get ready to get questions down on the second grade level. And as soon as the little girl finished, she said, and now for questions. Well, guess what? Every kid had their hand up with the question. You know, the adults didn't have to ask one thing. The kids would ask questions. Well, how long do you think the animal is from the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail? How do you think this animal breathes? I could not believe the level of questioning on the part of the kids. I could not believe the response of the students to the questions. And do you know what? Our second graders were pretty smart. If they didn't know, they just said, oh, I don't know, next question. <laughs> now, do you think our high school students do that? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, they certainly are learning how to think on their feet and cover their tracks at the high school level. Or the one little boy was asked the question, and the little boy said, uh, I've got that information in the book I got from the library. I can't remember it, but it's in my room in my backpack if you want to know. That told me that kid knew how to access information and to share it. So we're beginning to find out we can have these expectations. Now what kind of class will last year's second grade class be when they get to the high school? We're going to have a lot different look at the curriculum, but we call that authentic assessment. We're moving to portfolios for our students to where they really do show their best work. Within their portfolio will be their thoughts on why this is their best work, as well as the thoughts of the teachers. And we're making some final decisions of what ought to be in those portfolios. We believe that we're going to be moving, we're already moving in some classes, to student-led parent-teacher conferences. I had the opportunity to have a student-led conference last spring. And Donald was able to go to the computer, electronic portfolio, to show me some of his best work as well as his behavior management plan. So that there are a lot of exciting things that we need to understand about authentic assessment that move us from the true paper and pencil test that we've been so accustomed to, to the actual work of students so that they can demonstrate. We standardize tests in the fall. Do y'all do that in Oklahoma? Do you standardize tests in the fall? Use it for diagnostic data instead of doing that last little hurrah in the spring. Do y'all spring test, student achievement test? You need to change the fall. 
You've got to fall test to get the diagnostic data to better produce the instructional program to better meet the needs of the students. Then you'll look at your authentic assessment and your performance in the spring to be able to demonstrate what the students have been able to do. Now, Rick, if you'll move on, we'll take a look at some of these other programs. Okay. One of our secretaries had a, a grandson that was in the first grade that we, when we started our technology plan. And uh, towards the end of the year, they went to visit some of the second grade classrooms. And he went home after the visit and uh, was talking to his grandmother. He said, uh, you know, he, he said there weren't any computers in that classroom. Are they going to have computers next year? And Ruth Ann said, well, I don't know. They're talking about it and they want to. And it's in the plan, but they don't know if they're going to have enough money. And he said, well, if they don't have computers, I'm just going to stay in first grade. He said, I don't want to go second grade. That, that's the kind of commitment that we want to see out of the kids. And for those of you who may be worried about a of teachers who don't want computers in the classroom, the kids can have a tremendous effect on that. Uh, let me tell you about some of the courses that have been developed on the secondary level. And I have uh, video clips that I can show you on each of these, but because we're running so short a time, I'm going to have to just give you a brief summary of each one and then ask you that if you want further information to give us a call in Siloam. Uh, creating Publications is a, a team taught course between our business teacher, our computer teacher, and our art teacher. Uh, it's a two hour block class, not offered this year because uh, we didn't have a spot for it in our block schedule. But it's a, the, the concept of the class is a wonderful idea. It's a project oriented, uh, client based class. And what the kids do was to invite uh, clients in, like uh, we've had IBM EduQuest, uh, the Arvest Bank Group, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, Solomon Springs High School, all sorts of clients. They would invite them in, ask them what they needed, uh, interview them, then the kids would go to work on the computer, try and design a solution for what that, that client needed. Then the client would come back, and each student in the class would stand up and make a presentation of how they would solve the problem they had been pre presented with. Really uh, uh, a wonderful class. Uh, Project Paradigm was a, a one-hour uh, class that was taught kind of jointly by four different disciplines. Uh, this is another class that we have not offered this year that we plan to again in the future, a, an interdisciplinary class between four different teachers. What the students did was to uh, tackle an essential question, uh, uh, usually that had something to do with Northwest Arkansas. For example, one of the groups, uh, their question was to investigate uh, handicap access in Solomon Springs. Uh, the city of Solomon Springs had just received a $75,000 grant to make our buildings more accessible to the handicap. Uh, this group of students decided to investigate that and see it, uh, how they had done it. Uh, the local news station got so uh, involved with the kids and what they were doing and what they had found out that they decided to film it and show it on the local news. This is one of those things where the community and the city, the mayor, uh, got involved. And they found out that all of the things that they did uh, perhaps uh, were not really in the best interest of the handicapped, and so they agreed to make some changes. So a real relevant type of class that the kids enjoy and got some real learning experiences from. A couple of other classes that we are offering this year, one is a team talk class called Renaissance, which is uh, not an integrated class all year, but they take about a, a nine week period, and uh, what would be equivalent to your nine week period, and uh, study the, uh, this period in history known as the Renaissance which culminates in what they call a Renaissance Fair. This is something that's done at night. The kids all have to draw characters out of a hat, have to design their own costumes, and then they have to show up and participate in the fair that night uh, uh, as that character. They have a king and queen, and uh, really a neat type of thing where the parents are invited to attend. Good way to get parents involved in the school. Another class that we have is the humanities class, which is this is a screen on, on the Renaissance. A little bit about some of the things that they do. I'll skip that and go on to humanities, where the students examine the connection between the fine arts, literature, and world history through written and oral communication. This is a team taught class between our history teacher and our English, and she also teaches oral communications. Uh, this is a two-hour block class. 
Uh, they get, the students receive actually two credits, a credit in English, a credit in world history, a half a credit in oral communications, and a half a credit in fine arts. So you can see the attempt here, Mary mentioned this a while ago, what we are trying to do is to measure what the kids actually learn, not necessarily the amount of time that they spend in class. Uh, we were able to get this, this amount of credit approved through the State Department because of what the kids are required to do in that class. This is another course that's involved, uh, that's, that's centered around an essential question. Theirs is why I am who I am. And uh, this is the, the first class that I've heard when, where the kids make comments when they get finished. They talk about how the course has changed their life. You know, that's a pretty different type of comment. Usually when you ask the kids how they liked algebra or how they liked physics, they don't tell you that it was a course that changed their life. But uh, the kids do in this class. You can see here some of the topics that they study. This is probably one of the most popular classes that we have in the high school. Now, those, those are just a few of the specific courses. I'll turn it back over to Mary to talk to you a little bit about where we're headed. When we look at the past, I think it's obvious that we've got to do a lot of reflection on what has worked for teaching and learning in the past. I always caution, particularly administrators, you have to be very careful because we've done some very, very excellent things with teaching and learning in the classroom. Teachers become very offended if they think that what we're doing is throwing out everything we ever did. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to reflect on the past. We're working, as uh, Kent said, on a professional appraisal system that really is putting more responsibility on teachers to be reflective in their thinking and directive in their own professional growth and their own evaluation. And what I say time and time again is adults don't learn from experience. Adults only learn from reflecting on experiences. And we have to give ourselves the time to reflect. And we have to reflect on the past in order to go on. We have to take a lot of sacred cows to the slaughter. We did in Silent Springs. I would suggest you probably do wherever you are. That we have to realize that that is the past and that when we move to the present, what we're looking at is the present really only lasts for today. Uh, our society is changing so much that I even in Silent Springs after five years am afraid that today's innovations are going to become tomorrow's sacred cows. That as we shift paradigms, we need to be ready to shift them again. Because when we shift the paradigm, we create a new paradigm, and then we get very locked into it. As Mr. Jones said, we have some courses that we've offered over the past three years that as we move to a block schedule, they don't fit particularly that mold. So instead of saying that we're going to try to make them fit in the same way they did in the past, we can't do it. We have to say this year we're going to transition. We don't want them to become fatalities of the block schedule, but we now have to shift the paradigm after we shifted the paradigm only three years ago. So today is the present and the present only. When we look at the future, I say that the future is today because what we don't know happening outside is going to affect everything that we're trying to do today. Our world is smaller. It's smaller because we are more connected. It's smaller because we have more information at our fingertips. It's smaller because we can network with people all over the world. That's the good news. The, the challenge is that because of that, we have to become more centered on how we can access that and how we can make teaching and learning more relevant for how we're going to live in our society. So that when we look at the future, what we're looking at is learning has to change and we become more student-centered than teacher-centered. And for higher education, that means a lot of changes also. Higher ed has to look. We now have to retrain teachers from teacher ed programs when they come to Silent Springs if they haven't been trained at JBU where we have that partnership because they're not tra training them for a high-tech environment that we're trying to provide for our students. So at the table must be all the players, not just business and industry, but higher education as well as our communities itself. We have a world that is very portable and we have a world that is very highly functional in the technology that is out there and one that schools are going to have to play catch up to get there. 
We in Salem Springs have made so much as far as progress in this area, and yet Mr. Jones and I feel so burdened by the fact we're not where we know we ought to be. We have a school district not too far to the uh, west of us that just received about two to three million dollars from the foundation in that community. And they're going to put computers in every classroom. They're going to have a lab in every school. They're going to be networked throughout the world. And Mr. Jones and I look and say, it wasn't too long ago they called us to find out how to spell technology. And we also know that they're five to six computers short in each classroom, which tells us they're focusing on hardware and accessing information and haven't asked themselves the hard questions of teaching and learning, but we hope that that will come down the road for them. But their teachers will eventually tell them that they're short on the number of computers and the technology that will be available to students where instruction meets the students. So the future is one that we can't define, and I think that's what's important. We have to be ready to meet the future as the future meets us. So I want to close this as we started it again with the topic of our uh, conversation this morning, we have moved from the ABCs to a more technological language in our schools. And again, our focus must be on the students. These two, two students that I introduce you to now are Rick's sons. We have uh, Van, who is a junior, and Paul, who is a senior. And I hope when they leave Silent Springs High School, some of their experiences that we have provided them with different types of curriculum and expectations will serve them well as our other seniors have told us as they come back to visit us. But our focus, we believe, has to be student-centered and it has to be looking at the productivity of gentlemen like this and young ladies that will be entering our society, entering higher ed, and moving forward with solving some of the problems that we have in our world and some of the problems that we have just in our own communities to help us move forward. We appreciate being here. We wish that we had all day to spend with you, but we thank you for having us this morning. We hope that what we've shared with you can give you an idea of what we're trying to accomplish. And Rick, I don't see the screen. Someplace you'll find a screen that will give you the information to uh, contact us if you're interested in more information. We wish you the best for the rest of this day in this conference and hope that you'll be successful as you go back to your institutes of learning, whether they be the public schools or higher ed. Thank you. sessions from the yellow brochure the app that has the abstracts in it uh, there is a misprint on the, the times the uh, schools on the move presentation which actually has two different school districts within it that that session is a two-hour session but the two that are listed after that uh, leave the big chief tablet at home and integrating multimedia into the laboratories of biology classes those two are from 10 to 11.50. So if you go by the Friday schedule, which has the rooms listed on it, some of you may have a white sheet instead of a yellow sheet, but the one that says Friday on it, uh, the times are appropriate on here. They're incorrect in the brochure. But they are in those rooms and they are those topics. Uh, for those of you that weren't here yesterday, at this point we move over to the Noble Center, which is a different building. You can kind of follow the crowd. We do have some rules about uh, food and drinks in the classrooms over there, but there will be um, refreshments provided in the inner lobby area within Noble Center. And we will see you back over here at noon for our lunchtime speaker. And have a good morning. <laughs>